An elderly man is shot dead in front of his family at a July 4th celebration. No one knows where the bullet came from. How can police track down his killer? A charismatic leader of the Black Panthers is killed in a police raid. His supporters say he was assassinated. The police claim they shot him in self-defense. Can a forensic expert determine who is lying? A child dies in a drive-by shooting. Can a state-of-the-art computer link evidence from this crime to another and win a conviction? It takes a split second for a gun to deliver death. Solving the crime takes much longer, but with increasing speed, expertise, and accuracy, forensic detectives are zeroing in on their deadly target. In Bloomingdale, Illinois, a small town 40 miles northwest of Chicago, July 4th, 1989 began like any other Independence Day. Like people all across America, families and friends gathered to celebrate the country's birthday by relaxing and holding the traditional backyard barbecue. Kids amused themselves with sparklers while eagerly waiting for the sun to set and the town fireworks display to begin. On the picnic grounds, a carnival provided an endless array of diversions, something for everyone to enjoy. But for one Bloomingdale family, the celebration ended in tragedy. In a field near the picnic grounds, the family joined a crowd gathered to await the fireworks. The grandfather passed time playing with his grandchildren. Then, without warning, he tumbled out of his chair. His wife thought he had a heart attack. Two off-duty detectives happened to be picnicking with their own families nearby. They rushed to offer assistance. When they turned over the man's body, they found a bloody wound beneath his ribs, a bullet hole. This 64-year-old grandfather had been shot dead. Shock was followed almost immediately by mystification. No one had heard a shot or seen anything. A search of the field came up empty. No gun, not even a spent cartridge could be found. The killing was the most baffling case the Bloomingdale police had ever encountered. Who had shot the man and why? Unraveling the mystery, forging a link between victim and killer, would demand all the ingenuity forensic experts could muster. Lieutenant Richard Vaughn is the ballistics examiner at the DuPage County Sheriff's Department. As soon as an autopsy had been performed, the Bloomingdale police called him in. The coroner confirmed that a bullet had struck the victim on the right side, then penetrated beneath the rib cage, causing his death. He also recovered the bullet. Fortunately, it had not hit bone and was in near pristine condition. Vaughn's initial task was to try to establish what kind of gun had fired it, so he and detectives could begin to look for the gun and, ultimately, its owner. Under his scrutiny, the bullet's size and weight and any physical marks could provide vital information. The evidence bullet in this case, uh, the first question would be what caliber is it? Caliber is determined by the weight of the bullet and by the diameter of the bullet. Vaughn started by weighing the bullet on a digital balance. Then he measured it with an instrument called a micrometer. When the process was completed, he determined the bullet was a 44 caliber. 
It had come from one of the most powerful handguns on the market, a 44 Magnum revolver. Several companies manufacture such weapons. Vaughn had to determine the make and model of the one that shot the fatal bullet. He placed the bullet under a microscope and examined its rifling characteristics. All guns leave a series of spiral grooves on a bullet as it speeds down the barrel. The number of grooves, their width, and whether they twist to the left or right varies with the manufacturer. This particular bullet had six grooves and six lands, the raised regions in between. They spiraled along the bullet with a right-hand twist. Now Vaughn turned to a device called a measuring projection unit. It enabled him to accurately determine the widths of each land and groove. Armed with this information, Vaughn turned to a computer database called the General Rifling Characteristics File. Maintained by the FBI, it contains information about thousands of weapons. Feeding in the caliber, number, and width of lands and grooves, and the directional twist of the bullet enabled him to identify the probable make of the gun. We had a groove width measurement of 0.129 thousandths of an inch. When we then refer to the 44 Magnum caliber category, you will note that the probable make and model of firearm that could have fired the evidence bullet was a firearm manufactured by Sturm Ruger, and the model would be the Red Hawk model. Within two hours, Vaughn developed a vital piece of evidence. The gun was a Strum Ruger Red Hawk 44 Magnum. But a search of local gun shops turned up no record of any such weapon being sold. Vaughn decided the only way to trace the killer was to find where the bullet had been fired okay, from. An ammunition manual told him that a Ruger Red Hawk 44 Magnum has a maximum range of about a mile and a half. But the chances of locating where the bullet had been fired in an area that large would be next to impossible. To reduce the search area, Vaughn went back to the site of the killing to reconstruct the incident. All that he required was a mannequin, a lawn chair, and a wooden dowel. He seated the mannequin in the same place and position as the victim. Then he inserted the dowel through its body in the precise angle of the bullet wound. The dowel rod now represents the actual trajectory of the bullet. Since we have an entrance wound here on the right side and the bullet was recovered on the left side, you'll note that the dowel rod is pointing in this direction here. We will now refer to this as the alleged flight path of the bullet. The dowel pointed roughly northwest. If Vaughn was right, that was the direction from which the bullet had been fired. Back in his lab, he began to map out the area where the police should concentrate their search. This is a Bloomingdale Township map, which I was able to pick up at the highway department, uh, which I took to the scene. And it demonstrates or depicts the search area. Uh, you'll note this area here is the open field in which the spectators were seated waiting for the 4th of July fireworks to occur in this area here. The decedent was seated in a chair here. Now, we had determined by a quadrant that our search area was going to be to the north and northwest. But from where in this search area had the bullet been fired? Vaughn's references told him the muzzle velocity of a Red Hawk is 1,200 feet per second. But from the 15-inch deep wound in the dead man, a medical examiner estimated the bullet slowed down to less than 700 feet per second when it hit. With the help of a computer ballistics expert, Vaughn calculated how far the bullet must have traveled for its velocity to have been reduced to this amount. Uh, we came to realize that the impact velocity being approximately uh, 450 feet to 700 feet per second, that we would have to concentrate our search in an area between 500 yards and 700 yards. So our search area would have been in this span right here. 
So what we did is we actually established a cone of origin, if you will, where we would focus our search from this line depicted here to this roadway, which is depicted here. After narrowing the search area, Vaughn and police combed the neighborhoods between 500 and 700 yards northwest of the picnic grounds. They conducted door-to-door -door interviews, searching for any evidence that a large caliber gun had been fired. Eventually, they arrived at a residence on Lawrence Avenue. During a search of the backyard, they made a crucial discovery. In a corner was a 55-gallon drum perforated with holes. Vaughn felt they could have been made by 44 caliber bullets. The edges showed little sign of rust, suggesting they were new. Had they been made by the same magnum that killed the elderly man? To find out, Vaughn had to recover one of the bullets, bullets and compare it to the bullet from the dead man. He relied once again on dowels to point him in the right direction. With luck, they'd lead him to a bullet. We have uh, evidence that the shots uh, were fired at an angle where they entered a little bit higher than they exited. Um, you also note that the metal on this side, that there's an indentation here, that the actual metal folds inside, which is indicative of the, this being where the bullet entered. And on the other side, we have evidence of the bullet exiting, where the metal fold is actually folding towards the outside. So this is indicative of the bullet exiting. So we're going to take this dowel rod here, and we're going to reconstruct the trajectory. In other words, the flight path of the bullet from the time it struck the 55 gallon drum until it exits. Again, you can see the actual metal around the periphery of the hole and the fact that it's folded out is indicative that this is an exit. So this would demonstrate that this bullet continuing in a straight, straight flight path would most likely have hit the grass somewhere in here. So what we're gonna have to do is focus our search on this area. We're gonna have to conduct a grid search. Vaughn and detectives spread out to find a bullet. Despite their thoroughness, they found nothing. Perhaps the barrel had been moved since the shots were fired through it. If so, metal detectors would be required to search a larger area. Then one of the deputy sheriffs had an idea. Perhaps the shooters had been burning logs in the barrel while using it as a target. Maybe the bullets were in the nearby pile of ashes. He sifted through the cinders and found what he was looking for. If Richard Vaughn could prove the bullet came from the same gun that killed the elderly man, he'd have the break he needed. When the man died in a picnic ground in Bloomingdale, Illinois on July 4th, police had only two clues, the bullet recovered at autopsy and the wound it left behind. Now, ballistic examiner Richard Vaughn had a second bullet found near the 55-gallon drum. A comparison of the bullets would tell him if they came from the same gun. Every Ruger Red Hawk Magnum leaves similar rifling marks on a bullet, six lands and grooves with a right-hand twist. But every gun also leaves its own unique individual signature on the bullets it fires, produced by tiny irregularities in the rifling. The bullet found in the drum was deformed by the impact, but Vaughn was still able to discern a series of distinguishing marks. They were enough to conclude it came from the same weapon that killed the victim. The net was closing in, but an important question remained. Could a bullet fired from the backyard travel unobstructed for nearly a half mile to the picnic grounds? Vaughn enlisted the help of an engineering firm to survey the bullet's likely path. They recorded ground elevations and the positions and heights of every house and tree between the Lawrence Avenue residence and the picnic grounds. Then they constructed a diagram. The red line here demonstrates the calculated trajectory of the fatal bullet. The dark line here demonstrates the terrain. We do have documented here the dwellings that fell within the line of the trajectory of the fatal bullet. 
uh, what we were able to determine uh, was that this particular residence, for example, the bullet went directly to the right of it. But uh, this is, indicates where the barrel of the firearm was. Uh, this is the fence that was at the back of the property, of the suspect's property. And this is the area where the decedent was seated. On its half-mile journey to the picnic grounds were many potential obstacles. Amazingly, the bullet missed every one. But would it still possess enough power to kill once it got there? To make his case, Vaughn had to prove it could. He turned to wound ballistics expert Martin Fackler, who had devised a standardized way to test how far a bullet penetrates human flesh when traveling at various speeds. The depth of the wound depends on the velocity of the bullet. To simulate the penetrating power of a bullet after a half-mile flight, some gunpowder is removed to slow it down to between 400 and 700 feet per second. This is referred to as a bullet inertia puller, and we're going to use this to pull and separate the bullet from the cartridge case so that we are able to actually remove the gunpowder from the cartridge case. Now that the bullet has been separated... Vaughn carefully tips out a measured amount of the gunpowder. It's a trial and error process. Empty out some powder, fire around. Measure the bullet's speed. If it's too high, remove a little more gunpowder. If it's too low, remove a little less from the next round. To ensure that the bullet impacts the block at the intended velocity, its speed is measured with an electronic timer. Uh, this is a chronograph. This is used to measure the speed of a moving projectile. It is nothing more than a timer, and the timer is started by the shadow of a bullet passing between these first two rods, and the timer is stopped by the shadow of the bullet passing between the second two rods. The speed in feet per second of the projectile is then recorded in the front of the machine. Finally, when everything is set, the test bullet is fired into the gelatin. Firing in the hole. The bullet traveled 15 inches, almost identical to the depth of the fatal wound. What's more, like the bullet found in the victim, it had not deformed. The test proved that the bullet had enough power to kill the man from a half mile away. Further evidence that the shot had been fired from Lawrence Avenue. The results of Vaughn's test gave Assistant State's Attorney Joe Burkett grounds to serve a search warrant on Robert Logsdon, resident of the home where the drum was found. Logsdon admitted he and his girlfriend held a party on July 4th. But at first, he denied owning a handgun. As a convicted felon, it was illegal for him to possess one. He lied about virtually everything until he was confronted with facts that were known to us that we had put, put in the warrant, and he ultimately confessed and implicated his girlfriend as well in the shooting. There's a man who's dead. Under pressure from Burkett, Logsdon produced a 44 caliber Strum Ruger Redhawk. He later confessed and revealed the events of his party. It had started ordinarily enough, a barbecue for a few close friends. Sometime in the afternoon, Logsdon had gone into the house to fetch his Ruger Redhawk. A jug of water was placed on the 55-gallon drum as a target. Logsdon fired off five rounds. One hit the jug, but four missed and hit the drum instead. Then he handed the gun to his girlfriend, whose shot missed the jug and drum completely. From Logsdon's statement, Vaughn determined that the girlfriend fired the fatal bullet. Because she was shorter than Logsdon, she tilted the gun higher. The increased angle gave the bullet a trajectory high enough to reach the picnic grounds. Logsdon pleaded guilty to unlawful use of a handgun, to possessing a stolen weapon, and to involuntary manslaughter. His girlfriend also admitted firing the gun and likewise pleaded guilty to involuntary manslaughter. Logsdon was sentenced to six years. His girlfriend received 90 days 
plus probation. It was really just a tremendously successful investigation because um, as with any murder or any homicide, uh, police, police officers and prosecutors don't take holidays. We worked closely with the sheriff's office, the coroner's office, Bloomingdale Police Department, uh, Sergeant Vaughn and the crime lab, all, everybody did an excellent job. In Bloomingdale, victim and killer were completely unaware of each other's existence and were a half mile apart. It took the tools of forensic science and the dedication of law enforcement professionals and ballistics experts to bridge the gap. The Bloomingdale death was a tragic accident caused by carelessness and an astonishing twist of fate. Its randomness made it a challenge to solve. In Chicago, during the turbulent 1960s, an investigator struggled with a different challenge. A political activist lay dead. Was he killed in self-defense or assassinated? The bullet-riddled walls held the answer. December 4th, 1969, 4.45 a.m. 14 police officers, handpicked by Illinois State Attorney Edward Hanrahan, approached an apartment in Chicago's Oak Park area, the heart of the city's black ghetto. They were about to embark on what would become one of the most controversial events in Chicago's history. The first floor apartment was occupied by members of the Black Panther Party, a militant left-wing organization that preached social revolution. As the main group of police entered the front, a smaller force came in at the back. Fifteen minutes later, the tiny two-bedroom apartment was laced with 100 bullets. When the smoke cleared, two young Panthers were dead. Four more were injured, two of them seriously. Two policemen received superficial wounds. The raid yielded a cache of arms. 19 guns and boxes of ammunition. Among the dead was Fred Hampton, age 21, the charismatic leader of the Panthers' Illinois chapter. Black people need some peace. White people need some peace. And we are going to have to fight. We're going to have to struggle. We're going to have to struggle relentlessly to bring about some peace. Hampton was the 28th Black Panther killed by police in less than two years. The Black Panthers emerged in Oakland, California, a product of the 1960s social unrest. While black leaders such as Martin Luther King advocated civil disobedience and political action to advance civil rights, the Panthers seemed prepared to use violence if necessary. The December 4th raid quickly became a media event as the Panthers and the authorities gave radically different accounts of what happened. Hanrahan claimed the police were serving a legitimate search warrant when the Panthers started shooting. When the police officers announced their office, they were fired upon. In a film demonstration, the police gave their account of the raid. In this version, Panther Mark Clark was sitting in a chair in the living room he fired a shotgun through the front door as police approached. Police then burst in and shot him dead. As more Panthers began shooting, the exchange escalated. There were three shots fired from the rear bedroom. They were directed directly at the back door uh, as I was coming in. I backed out again. According to police, when they entered Hampton's bedroom, they found him in bed, lying on his stomach. He opened fire with a 45 caliber automatic and a shotgun. In self-defense, they shot him twice in the head. But the Black Panthers told a different tale. The police burst in without warning, started shooting, and killed Mark Clark, who fired only after being fired upon. No other Panther used a weapon. More police stormed in from the back, found Fred Hampton asleep, and shot him twice in the head before he had a chance to wake up. Hampton's girlfriend was in bed with him when the raid began. Still half asleep, I looked up and I saw bullets coming from it looked like the front of the apartment, from the kitchen area. 
They were uh. pigs would just shoot. Um, when he looked up, just looked up, he didn't say a word, he didn't move, except for moving his head up. He laid his head back down to the side like that. He never said a word, he never got up out the bed. The Panthers were convinced that Fred Hampton was assassinated and that police had launched a full-scale cover-up. Panther lawyer Skip Andrew acted as their spokesman. Anyone who went through that apartment and examined the evidence that was remaining there could come to only one conclusion, and that is that Fred Hampton, 21 years old and a member of a militant, well-known militant group, was murdered in his bed, probably as he lay asleep. Police arrested the surviving Panthers and charged them with several offenses, including attempted murder. To defend the Panthers, their lawyers needed evidence to support their version of the raid. They turned to ballistics expert Herbert McDonnell. He seemed an unlikely choice. More than once, he had investigated gunfights between the police and black radical groups. He usually sided with the police. I understood it was a shootout similar to the ones I'd investigated before in the Republic of New Africa and Fred Ahmed Evans and others. So I expected this would be another black militant group who were in the wrong and the police were in the right. As McDonald saw his role, it was to decide whether the police or the Panther account of the raid was nearer the truth. To determine this, he would have to reconstruct the raid from bullet holes and spent bullets in the apartment. It would take all of McDonald's skill to find out what happened. He entered the apartment through a small foyer, which led to the living room. Mark Clark, the first Panther to die, had been shot here. Beyond the living room were two bedrooms. Fred Hampton had died in the farther one. Finally, at the back lay the kitchen, through which the rear contingent of Hanrahan's force had entered. McDonald started his investigation in the living room. I spent ten and a half hours collecting evidence, taking photographs, and observing the trajectories of various bullets. I had never seen an area that had been so shot up as the living room. On one wall, the south wall, there were 45 bullet holes of various calibers. The larger ones were 45 caliber fired from a Thompson submachine gun. There were blasts from shotguns, and there were 30 caliber and 38. Having different sizes made it somewhat easy to establish which were fired from various weapons. Who had fired these shots, the Panthers or the police? McDonnell hoped his investigation would provide the answer. Come on in. As streams of sightseers Where? trooped through the apartment, McDonnell set to work, unpacking the simple tools of his trade, a camera, notebook, ruler, and a ball of string. Soon, he made a curious request. I asked if I could have some straws brought in and some dowels. The panthers went out, some of them, and they came back very quickly with a big handful of straws and a bundle of dowels, small ones. After measuring the precise position of every hole in the living room wall, McDonald gently pushed the dowels and straws into them. By following the direction of a dowel, he could trace the path of a bullet. The straws protected the holes, ensuring that a dowel did not knock out plaster and destroy vital evidence. When he finished, the result was startling. All 45 bullets had been fired from the vicinity of the living room door. All must have come from the police as they burst into the room. When I began looking at the number of bullet holes, it became apparent that the vast majority seemed to be coming into the apartment rather than going out. The investigation seemed to be favoring the Panthers' version of the raid, but the police were quick to state their case. In an interview with the Chicago Tribune, Hanrahan produced a photograph of bullet holes in the molding around the back door. He called it irrefutable evidence that the Panthers had fired at the police as they entered from the rear of the apartment. 
reporters studied the photos. One of the four pictures you gave the Tribune had two bullet holes on the right side of what was supposed to be the rear door. But when reporters inspected the apartment, they found the marks to be not holes, but nails. Hanrahan backpedaled. I have said that uh, we released the pictures. We have not characterized or described uh, the uh, conditions that they portray, other than to say that that is an accurate portrayal of that uh, particular object. Now the police changed their story. The Panther bullets, they said, whistled through the open door. That is not what McDonnell found. The claims that there were bullets fired out at the police out the back door are unfounded. There is no way the bullets could not have hit a person in the door, and if they missed them, they would have struck a brick wall. McDonald continued his investigation in the front bedroom, where he discovered bullets fired in the living room had passed through the wall. While in the bedroom, he noticed the door was also pierced by bullets. He counted 25 of them. The police had claimed Panthers in the bedroom shot at them and refused to stop firing despite orders from officers. At first sight, the door seemed to confirm this part of the police's story. All the shots in the door came from the inside out, exactly what would be expected if Panthers in the bedroom had been shooting at the police. But there was a puzzle. None of those 25 shots hit an officer nor was there any trace of them in the hallway beyond. But on closer examination, if those bullets were fired when the door was closed, as was claimed by the police, they would have struck the hall right across from that bedroom door. There was not one point of impact there. So having the dowels between the living room and that bedroom recessed, I could open the door all the way. And then all I had to do was to push the dowels from the living room side, and out of the 25 holes in the door, 25 were explained by the bullets coming from the living room when the door was wide open. When these shots had been fired, he concluded, the bedroom door was open, roughly parallel to the bedroom wall. Bullets fired by the police in the living room passed through the wall, then continued on through the door. By now, the evidence was overwhelming. Of all the bullets fired, only one, a shotgun blast in the living room door, seemed to have been fired by a Black Panther. This was beginning to look like a very one-sided gunfight. There were at least 99 fired in. So when you have 99 to 1, it's not a shootout. It's a shoot-in. But what happened in the back bedroom when Hampton lost his life? Was he waiting in bed, ready to fire, as police claimed? Or was he asleep and murdered in cold blood by the police, as the Panthers insisted? The trajectory of the bullets through his skull might solve the riddle. On January 3rd, 1970, a federal grand jury ordered Hampton's body exhumed. Two earlier autopsies had given conflicting results. One, conducted by the Cook County coroner, reported that the two bullets in his head came from opposite directions. That suggested he was awake and moving. Hampton's relatives arranged a second one by a private pathologist. He found that both bullets had struck from the right and traveled on roughly parallel paths, suggesting Hampton was lying down. The new autopsy confirmed the second one regarding the trajectory. Both shots had entered Hampton's head from the right. The findings supported the Black Panther's claim that Hampton had been asleep, lying on his back with his head down. From the trajectory into the head of Fred Hampton, both shots were fired in nearly parallel trajectories which projected back to the doorway. So if one policeman came in and fired a shot, uh, Fred would have still been lying in that position when the second person came in with a different caliber and fired a second shot at what probably was either a dead or dying person. McDonald's meticulous investigation 
and the autopsy supported the Panther version of events. It looked as if the police had indeed assassinated Fred Hampton. But the most crucial question had not yet been answered. Did the Panthers or the police fire first? If the Panthers had started the shooting, even if they had fired just a single shot, the police could maintain they shot back only in self-defense. To answer this question, McDonnell performed his most dazzling piece of detective work. The gunfight evidently had started as the police stormed the living room. McDonnell found that the living room door contained two bullet holes. His examination of powder marks and wood splinters established that one bullet came from outside, from a police 38 revolver. He recovered the bullet from the living room wall. A second, larger hole likely came from Mark Clark's shotgun. After blasting a hole in the door panel, the slug had gone through a wall and ended up in the stairwell outside the apartment. McDonnell had an idea. By figuring out how far the door was open when the 38 bullet and the shotgun slug passed through it, he might be able to tell who shot first. He traced the bullet's paths as they flew through the door. He knew that, by their own admission, the police had forced open the door as the raid began. He threaded a string through the 38 caliber hole in the door to the 38 hole in the wall. Then he adjusted the door until the string was straight. The door was barely ajar. Next, he ran a line from the slug hole in the stairwell through the hole in the door and then to Mark Clark's chair. This time, when the string was pulled straight, the door was three quarters open. Through his experiments, McDonnell pieced together the scenario. As police pushed open the door at the start of the raid, they fired the 38. As it swung open further, a Panther shotgun went off. That was the only evidence of any shot being fired out. McDonald's conclusion was clear. The police fired first. According to McDonald's findings, the police broke in, firing a 38 caliber pistol as they slammed open the living room door. A panther, presumably Mark Clark, returned the fire. As the fusillade of police bullets poured into the apartment, Panthers fled to the second bedroom, where they tried in vain to awaken Fred Hampton. When the police reached the bedroom, they shot Hampton twice in the head. In court, charges against the surviving seven Black Panthers were eventually dropped. No indictments were ever handed down against State Attorney Hanrahan or the 14 officers involved in the raid. But Hanrahan's credibility had been tarnished and his political career was ruined. Twelve years later, in a civil suit brought by the Panther survivors, the raiders were found liable and the city ordered to pay $1.8 million in damages. McDonald's detailed investigation helped to tip the scales and ensure that in the end, justice was done. It's been 30 years since Fred Hampton's death. But today, crime solving takes as much tenacity and ingenuity as ever. Investigators are finding a new ally in the computer. It's proving time and again that a criminal's past can catch up with him. On March 8, 1996, a young boy was spending the evening as any 12-year-old would when tragedy struck. A gang war simmered on the streets of his New Orleans neighborhood. The boy became a casualty of that war, a bullet in his head from a senseless drive-by shooting. Within minutes, police and paramedics were on the scene. They rushed to save the boy's life, but from the start, the prognosis looked grim. Homicide detectives from the New Orleans Police Department began interviewing eyewitnesses. 
two men who had run for safety when the drive-by occurred returned to the scene. One of them was the victim's uncle. The men admitted to police that they were the intended victims. They recognized the car and identified the trigger man as Kevin Jordan, a gang member and drug dealer. Meanwhile, the child was taken to the hospital. 15 hours later, he died. As the search for Kevin Jordan started, Sergeant Michael Rice and John Treadaway, firearms examiner for the New Orleans police, began their own quest. Two bullets had been found at the crime scene, and a third had been recovered from the little boy. Could they link those bullets to a gun and then link that gun to the killer. Uh, the bullet was placed in our evidence room and it was delivered to the firearm section for me to examine. Uh, examining the bullet, I found that it was a 38 caliber having a six right rifling twist. Most drive-by shootings involve semi-automatic handguns, but this bullet was fired from a revolver. So I was able to inform the detective bureau that the gun that was used was uh, a 38 caliber revolver. But were all three bullets fired from the same 38? <laughs> to find out, Treadaway had to compare the fine details of each one. So, do you see how pronounced this is? If you look up on a monitor in the yes. groove, uh -huh. you can see about uh, two thirds of the way down, it's a good match. It notches on the following land and the following groove. This is a, this no is doubt. a hit, no okay. doubt at all. This is a, Terrific. Both, both bullets fired from the same weapon, no doubt. Okay. And I think this is what they needed. Now, detectives in the field knew that only a single 38 revolver had been used. Until they found it, there was little more that Treadaway could do. Open the door, please! Whoa, man. Whoa, man. Whoa. Detectives, meanwhile, learned the name of the driver. He was Henry Talley. They also found out he owned a 38 caliber revolver. On March 16th, they arrived at Tally's home, armed with search warrants. A search turned up drug paraphernalia, marijuana, crack cocaine, and three guns, including his 38 caliber revolver. He was taken in for questioning. Tally's weapons were confiscated and sent to Treadaway at the ballistics laboratory. Could he tie the 38 revolver to the bullet that killed the boy? If so, the police could build a solid case against Tally and the alleged trigger man, Kevin Jordan, who had already been arrested on suspicion of murder. The first order of business was testing for fingerprints. Had Tally or Jordan last fired the gun and left prints on the trigger? Timothy Susano, a fingerprint expert with New Orleans Police Department, demonstrates how he finds them. Latent fingerprints, prints invisible to the naked eye, are developed in a two-stage process. The first involves fumigating with superglue. Molecules of the glue will stick to a print. And you want to take your liquid superglue and pour it into the lumen dish. Next, I'm going to place the lumen dish onto a hot plate that's located inside this tank. That's going to heat the superglue and accelerate the fuming process. Within an hour, the gun is cooked. Now it's ready for the second stage of the test. It's washed with a fluorescent dye. If any prints exist, the dye will adhere to them and become visible under the ultraviolet light source. Unfortunately, none showed up on the 38 found at Tally's residence. The test could not help pin the shooting on Tally or Jordan. Still, the test is often worth performing. Sometimes it can yield dramatic results. This is an example of a uh, partial latent fingerprint that was developed on the trigger guard of a weapon that was used in a murder. As you can see, the partial fingerprint right here, that's on the front part of the trigger guard, which is located right here. To establish a connection between Tally's gun and the fatal bullet, Treadaway needed to inspect a bullet shot from the gun. This is our ballistic recovery room. 
In this room is our ballistic tank that we test fire our weapons in. This is Officer Gwen Serpass. He's going to test fire these weapons. We're going to test fire this uh, 38 first. Uh, before we do anything with it, uh, we normally like to check to make sure that the weapon is functional. Uh, make, we make sure that there are no obstructions in the barrel and uh, all the parts on the weapon are in place. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and load it. We need to put some ear protection on. Uh, it gets a little loud in here. The gun is fired into an 800 gallon tank of water, informally called the hot tub. Water halts the bullet without distorting its shape or marking its surface. Once the weapon's fired, I then re uh, unload the weapon, and remove the spent casings. The bullet retrieval system is simple but effective. A broom handle and a lump of silly putty. Once the bullet was recovered, its markings were examined and compared with bullets found at the crime scene. The match was undeniable. So I performed my test fire and examined the bullet, the test bullet, under the microscope with the three bullets that I received previously and determined that that gun had fired those three bullets. Tally's gun had indeed shot the little boy. Both Tally and Jordan were convicted felons, and by now the New Orleans police had enough evidence to charge Jordan with murder. But they suspected that the guns found in Tally's house had been used in other crimes. Could a new computer system implicate Tally in past crimes? When the 12-year-old boy died in a drive-by shooting in 1996, New Orleans police had a brand new crime-solving tool available. Earlier that year, they installed the Integrated Ballistic Identification System, or IBIS. It dramatically speeds up the time it takes to match bullets from crime scenes to guns confiscated by police. Sergeant Michael Rice runs the IBIS operation. For him, it's a vast improvement from the old method. We would go and physically get these guns and test farm and examine them on the uh, microscope. Well, right now, uh, with, with our IBIS system, we can now simply, as a matter of routine, test fire these weapons and put them into IBIS. This image will then be correlated and uh, uh, checked against all of our current database. And if this gun had been used in a crime, we will know about it uh, in, in a very short period of time, perhaps within the hour. At the heart of IBIS is a sophisticated computer program linked to an elaborate microscope. Attached to the microscope are two tiny video cameras. When a test bullet is placed under one of the cameras, its magnified image appears on the screen. Greg McRae is one of the New Orleans detectives trained to use the new system. We have the uh, projectile, the bullet itself, mounted on a little fixture with the information recorded on it. Uh, it's glued on here. We're going to mount it to the machine, rotate it, and lock it in. At the flip of a switch, the cradle begins to move turning the bullet through one complete revolution, scanning an image of the bullet into the computer. As you can see, you see striations, uh, you see groovings, you see markings. As we move it down, we'll take a picture of it. Uh, the machine digitizes this picture as it takes it. Now, when we process it, it is, the picture is taken and then processed digitally from this machine into the next machine, the next computer, which will in turn correlate it. Built into IBIS is a program designed to scan each image for its distinctive pattern of marks or lines. Having picked it out, the program searches through its database looking for other images of bullets that match. Within less than a minute, it can scrutinize thousands of bullets.
a task that would take a ballistics expert like John Predaway years to perform. This part of IBIS is called bulletproof. A second subsystem, Brass Catcher, enables him to scan and match spent shells. The casing, which is the other section of the bullet, would be put in this area here and locked in here and secured. This particular uh, microscope will take a picture with the camera mounted up here of the back end, or I should say the breech face of that casing. The breech face and also the firing pin, which is in this area right here. Now the computer records the shell's distinctive features, the positions and shapes of indentations left by the firing pin and tiny gouges left as it's ejected from the weapon. The operation is completed in two to three minutes. IBIS had been installed less than a month when a bullet from the 38 revolver that killed the 12-year-old boy was entered into it. There were no hits, no matches with the thousands of other bullets in the computer's database. But the system's real power was demonstrated with bullets test fired from a second gun, a 45 caliber automatic found in Henry Talley's apartment. The firing pin, which we're looking at, if you look very closely, you can see this duck image right here, uh, center in the firing pin itself. But this is very clear. We knew from looking at the screen that the probability of a match was, was very, very high. Ibis made a hit, implicating Henry Talley in another unsolved drive-by shooting. It was enough to strengthen the case against him regarding the death of the child. IBIS had proved itself on its first case. Prior to IBIS, this case would have probably been unsolved. It would have never, been, never picked up any additional follow-up unless there was a specific reason for it. We have um, uncovered and linked uh, uh, many, many cases involving uh, homicides as well as uh, shootings here in the city. And we made those links and those uh, correlations and, and tied them all together by simply what Greg's doing right now. And uh, we're kind of proud of what we do here. And um, I, would, I would not want to be without Ibis today. The death of the 12-year-old boy was solved partly by traditional ballistics work. But without the Ibis computer system, police would never have connected Tally's weapons to another crime that might have otherwise gone unsolved. Both Kevin Jordan and Henry Talley were convicted of first-degree murder and are now serving life sentences. By developing new ways to trace bullets to guns and guns to criminals, forensic detectives are increasingly able to turn a criminal's own ammunition against him. So long as there's a bullet, there's a clue. And so long as there's a clue, there's a chance to catch a killer. Thank you.